HVC Refrigeration Heat Load Calculations, HET 191, Week 9, Selecting Heating and Cooling Equipment. The objective of this week assignment is to help the HVC learner to be able to develop an appreciation for the importance of the Manual J, understand the different types of issues that can affect heat loads, uh, be able to uh, analyze the construction of a home and determine the type of heat gain, use charge tables and forms to calculate the heat gain of a home, locate manufactured data sheets and information sheets to choose the proper type of equipment, choose the type of equipment and to determine the CFMs required. After an HVC technician has determined the heat uh, capacity of a structure, the technician must consider many other factors to do a suitable job for the customer. Factors such as the location, the type of air conditioning equipment, the duct layout, and the amount of airflow through the home will be uh, become vital to the complete and the competent job that a technician will uh, do for the customer. So some of the terms uh, we're going to discuss in talking about heat uh, input for air conditioning system, output capacity for air conditioning system, and also the duct system. When we are uh, doing the a job for the uh, customer, and we use the manual J to help um, determine uh, the criteria of the uh, information that we need for um, the structure. Um, the things that we need to look at, the do's and, and also the don'ts. Uh, we should be able to use indoor conditions that are uh, compatible with the comfort chart, uh, which looking at uh, table 1A, which lists out every city and state in the United States that give you, well at least all the major cities in the United States, to uh, give you a uh, estimate of the outdoor conditions. Consider the orientation of the structure where the walls are facing of the house. Is it east, north, south, west, or northwest, or northeast? Or whatever com combinations will um, a play a factor and determine heat load capacities. Looking at the overhangs, um, looking at the even the pitch of the roof can um, make a a big difference in how uh, the house will absorb or dissipate heat energy. Here's other things we need to consider. Um, some of the things about the, the, how tight the building is. If it's a leaky structure or is it very tight. Looking at the uh, if the ductwork is uh, sealed correctly or at all. Um, of course, if it's not, there will be uh, larger amounts of losses based on leakages through the ductwork. Looking at uh, other issues that just going through the manual J, it will help you to list out things and help you keep from uh, missing items that you may go through as you look at a structure. So basically doing a, a, a thorough survey of a home will help the technician from um, missing things and to get as accurate um, number and BTUs as possible. Here's some other things that we need to look at as we go through and but just go through the list and so that would help you to uh, make a, a, a accurate decision of, of picking certain things out of the uh, the list to make it um, as uh, close as accurate uh, as it possibly can. There's other things. Just go through the list. Just take a time and pick these things out. Improper practices. Never ever use rule of thumbs. However, I hate to say this, but I believe there's too many 
uh, technicians or companies out there that actually do use rule of thumbs because yes it is it's a time consuming to uh, to go through a house and do a survey and to uh, list everything out to uh, do a heat load calculations for a home and it's very quick and easy to do a rule of thumb but most of the problems come in our fill because we do use rule of thumbs the problem is when they're a house that doesn't fit that rule of thumb is where the problems come so we need to stop doing that so if I could tell any technician out there any student do not use rule of thumbs because th that can cause you to have a bad name in this field because we make mistakes not because we want to but because the house that that one house that we came across that doesn't fit that rule of thumb which gives us the most headaches so heat loss and heat gain depend on individual circumstances and characteristics and so these every house is different of course in a subdivision maybe all the houses are the same or constructed the same and yes if we did one we did them all but moving from different areas in the city can affect how the house is going to be determined. So when replacing uh, equipment, do not use the existing equipment sizes because the newer equipment is probably more efficient and because it's more efficient there's less losses and because of that um, we could actually, um, because of the newer equipment it uh, could be sized slightly smaller. But then again we still should do a heat load calculations because um, because of the efficiencies of equipment uh, if we just look at the structure without considering that maybe the equipment was an oversized in the beginning but we should still go through and do a calculation so comfort systems performance is only as good as the accuracy of the uh, load calculation so keep that in mind at all times no matter if it's replacement equipment or new construction Now, to help us, there is software out there. And the software can make us uh, well, uh, more accurate in the, uh, and keep us from missing things because it will take you step by step through the, uh, the whole process. And, but then again, make sure you have um, good software. Because there's a lot of companies out there that put things out and they may not follow everything with Manual J. They say they Manual J information, but uh, if they didn't uh, truly use their uh, prioritary uh, sh uh, tables and charts and things and its estimates, then of course then we could have issues with uh, accuracy. Section three of the Manual J go into things that we need to uh, consider. So section three will go through its important issues and concepts. So we need to have um, basic skills as we go through this. And as we go through doing calculations, as we do a survey, we use basic math to do it. There's no big thing. So filling out uh, the, sh the charts to determine square feet of a house and also determine the cubic feet is using those uh, things to determine that so follow each step to uh, to be able to determine these uh, these numbers and then again like I said heat laws calculations uh, used for design values but also heat gain calculations used for design values and these are how it's listed out in the manual J So, uh, cooling temperature different values are used to find cooling and heat transfer multipliers. Is multiplying those numbers together to come up with um, BTUs or heat gains through the structure. So just take a look at these bullet points as you go through, and just working you through uh, examples of how to determine these things. We talked about over the past couple of weeks fenestration, and this is a term that we need to use 
uh, when we're describing windows, glass doors, skylights, and things like that. Fixed values uh, are defaults that cannot be adjusted in the Manual J and are listed in Appendix 2. So in the Manual J, you look in Appendix 2, those are where you get those values from, and it doesn't change. So if you have something that doesn't fit that category, we need to use the unabridged Manual J that go into a lot more detail than we find with the uh, abridged Manual J. Look at figure uh, 3.1 and look at some defaults. And this is listing out some of the criteria that we need to go through. And you saw this before other weeks, but we, since we talk about cooling this week, um, we need to go over these things again because there's heat loads that we need to consider, especially because we are gaining heat from outdoors and there may be internal loads that we need to consider. Indoor design conditions, we look at uh, comfort is the primary reason people purchase heating and cooling equipment. Comfort conditions are uh, a fundamental issue as far as equipment sizing and system airflow, uh, which is uh, our concern. So uh, comfort conditions are a basic input of the load estimate procedure. So the um, perception of uh, comfort depends on the physical attributes of the individual. And these are some of the things that you need to look at the age, sex, weight, health, um, how people will uh, are sensitive to um, their the, the humidity and other things that's inside of the house. So everybody's going to be different, but uh, we're going to get as close as possible. We cannot be perfect for every person because who knows what's going to happen down the road. They sell the house, somebody else got a, a different comfort level. That's why we have thermostats and humidistats in the house so people can adjust it to their comfort level. Here we look at this. Uh, this is, uh, most people fall within this uh, range. If you look at a psychometric chart and you look at the, um, the dry bulb temperature and the relative humidity, and we see that uh, there is a range that people fall into in the summer and also in the winter. The outdoor design conditions uh, from table 1A like I said earlier, that is list every city and state, every major city in the states that will uh, give you uh, different values, such as the elevation, the latitude, the dry bulb temperature for heating, the dry bulb temperature for cooling, uh, the design grains of moisture that you will find. Um, so as we go through this, we can um, look at and pick the, whatever city that we're um, doing a design for. For example, Chicago, we go across, we find O'Hare Airport, and we find the information, we go down to the grains of moisture, and it gives us that number of 36. We could plot it out, and we can look at the comfort level based on that number of grains. Okay, 100 grains minus 64 grains so gives 36 grains which is needed to be removed from the outdoor air because we know that the air inside the house come from outdoors to be able to maintain a 50 percent relative humidity indoors. Here we look at the construction of the house and we get that construction number and we can uh, look how the house constructed and from the different tables to help us to make a um, uh, decision of how tight the house is and how the heat going to transfer through it. Here's another uh, chart that gives us the um, comparison and we look at uh, line 9 and table 9 and we got the heat loss for hot water piping and to give you not supported to give us that information. So as we go through, we uh, 
see internal heat loads and that's based on the number of people and the things that we find inside of the house such as appliances and other issues. We look at the tightness category. Um, we look at the ductwork. We look at any other things that can cause infiltration and exfiltration. And we look at air changes. Some of the things we need to consider such as exterior walls, we look at construction, and we look at how the uh, uh, air can leak through this, uh, the sills and other uh, components of the house that enter the house. And this is a closer picture of that. We can see the sills and how it's joined together. And uh, these days, we can use certain things like a sill sealer to help reduce air from leaking in. Uh, if it's an older house, to seal the house, we have to caulk or uh, use some type like polyurethane foam to seal those uh, areas to keep air from leaking in from outdoors. Here's other areas where we can uh, lose or gain uh, air into the house. And if you follow through, they can show you the ductwork, we see the, um, the sills, we see vents in the house, we see other areas where we can um, uh, have infiltration. This is how we seal the house to tighten the house up, to keep from, to make the house more efficient by insulating and by using vapor barriers and by sealing up uh, with using insulation uh, how that can keep moisture and also air from leaking into the house. Here's construction of a studded wall and you see the construction of it and how we can gain or lose um, the uh, air from a house. Construction again of a, a typical wall. We see a door and a window, how it's framed, and but we get chances to uh, see the construction of it. Here's a corner and how it is put together and how it's constructed. And this is important to understand because uh, if you understand the construction, you know where air can leak into the house. And this corner, you see the bracing. The bracing is used to uh, give it strength in the corner to keep it from uh, deflecting. That's one way you can do it. Another way you can do it, they could put plywood in the corners and the plywood will give it also structure and strength. This is uh, foam boards. Foam boards is with two, two things. It give it strength but also it will insulate. And so this is a very common thing these days because uh, this foam board uh, will strengthen up the walls, keep from deflection, but also uh, give you an R value uh, to, uh, to, to actually help insulate, to give you more uh, thermal barrier. It's a house under construction, and we can see that uh, the construction of this house, that they haven't put the windows in, but you can see the sheeting on the outside of it as they're sealing up the house. Typical window. Uh, this window is a double pane window. Uh, it's vinyl, and it um, can have a certain amount of infiltration through the window. And But, of course, the the better the construction of the window, the better uh, it will uh, keep air from leaking in but through a, uh, a barrier, but also uh, thermal. Uh, it will reduce the rate of uh, heat uh, either entering the window or leaving the window. Here's another window through Anderson. Anderson uh, Windows is a, um, a brand name that we find out there. And this is a vinyl slider type window. This is a, another type of window. This is a awning window that will um, open up by cranking a handle and it will swing the window open. You can turn it uh, counterclockwise and will close the window. This is also another type of awning window. Instead of opening sideways, it will lift up as awning. construction again, looking at uh, other parts of the house, the top of the uh, a wall would be 
uh, a top plate. It usually is a double top plate with studs, two by four studs. And you can see the ease and sophic and how the fascia and the sophic is built uh, up. And But the whole construction coming past the walls is considered the eaves. So the eaves has the sophic, which is the bottom part of the eave, and the fascia is the front or the face of the eave. Here again, we see the construction and how the roof sheeting um, joins together. But the main thing is how we insulate. The insulation will, should be brought all the way where you see the dotted line. Uh, that's where the insulation for the attic need to be brought to. Because if not, we can still lose a great deal of heat energy in the corner of the inside wall in the corner of the inside wall if it's just brought to that level. So to insulate it correctly, it should be brought all the way to the end of the uh, top plate. Here's a picture of insulation of a house to and also show venting where you see a roof vent, but putting insulation in the attic, uh, insulating the, the walls, uh, putting the right type of insulation, either a vapor barrier to seal out air, because fiberglass insulation is only as good as how tight the insulation is. Fiberglass insulation is not tight at all. Air can leak through it, and if air leaks through the insulation, it loses a great percentage of its insulation value. So either craft paper, like you see on the right side, where you see the uh, brown paper, or some type of uh, plastic sheeting where you see uh, on the left side where you see the uh, like the plastic staple to the studs. This is different types of insulation, rigid fiberglass bats, uh, loose filled which can be cellulose which is blown in the attic or sometimes if even blown into this uh, the, uh, the stud cavity of walls uh, blanket type and reflective type which is usually rigid that have a, uh, a foil uh, film on the outside of it and that is used to help reflect radiant heat radiant heat that's a lot of times I forgot about is he could travel multiple different ways through conduction, through convection, and through radiation. Most insulation will take care of the uh, conduction and, con and, con and convection, but it allows radiation to go through. But a foil backing will take care of the uh, radiant type. This is fiberglass bats, which has a um, paper, or they call it uh, craft paper type of um, um, sheeting on the outside of it to keep air from leaking through. It's a picture of somebody installing it, they stapling it to the to the joists. This is how you will insulate the um, the walls by uh, making a complete we call the envelope envelope. So the total outside structure completely need to be sealed and insulated uh, correctly to be, and vented to be able to have a tight insulated house but also been able to control the ventilation into the house by bringing outside air in because if it's too tight of course uh, whatever is in the house it could be viruses or bacteria and things it would just circulate throughout the house so we just still need to have ventilation but to have it insulated and control the ventilation this is another how we sealed uh, we talked about this earlier but completely sealing it not only just putting insulation there but sealing it somehow and actually fiberglass works but it's not as well as if we use polyurethane foam two-part polyurethane foam works extremely well because it insulates but also it uh, seals air from leaking in because it's a closed cell type of foam and it sticks to whatever it's sprayed to. If we get a crawl space uh, it should be um, also properly installed where you will have the craft paper or the vapor barrier 
toward the floor, not toward the um, the opening, but needs something to keep it from falling down. So it needs to be sealed and stapled, uh, or using some type of polyurethane foam sprayed in that in the cavities. Here's another thing of insulating the concrete. If it's on top of a slab floor, there should be insulation underneath the concrete to act as a thermal barrier. And that would keep the heat into the floor to keep from having uh, floors from cracking or losing a great deal of heat energy through the floors in the wintertime. One thing we need to have, um, a vapor barrier. Without a vapor barrier, moisture can leak from indoors or outdoors through the walls, and then if the insulation becomes saturated with moisture, it becomes useless. So vapor barriers is always needed. Either a vapor barrier outside, uh, underneath the, uh, um, the siding or the bricks, or inside of the, the structure uh, before it goes outdoors. So you don't want the moisture to go either direction either from inside to outside or, or outside to inside. And this is what happens if you do have a vapor barrier. It protects the insulation and protects the house. Here's other ways that can be problems if it's not insulated correctly. Uh, we could have issues with um, moisture coming into the structure and this moisture can leak in and cause damage to the insulation. Like you see here, um, once the insulation gets wet, it becomes compact. Once compact, it doesn't insulate very well. Plus, it can cause uh, moisture and damage the drywall or cause mold to grow and other issues. Um, so, sealing up things, making sure um, the roof and other areas doesn't have what you call ice dams building up. So using uh, the right construction, even though we don't build a house, uh, if, but if we are insulating or part of the insulation process, we need to um, understand this when we um, doing the that type of work. Here again, ventilation. Ventilation helps with removing heat and moisture. Is another way that can be a, a problem, um, but also if we don't put some type of baffles in to help direct airflow, um, air may not uh, vent correctly into the uh, structure. Here again, we have um, sealing up vents and to keep air from leaking through, sealing up any openings around windows. Years ago, they would just stick insulation like fiberglass uh, inside of the uh, between the windows and the framing, and of course, air leaked through, and it just lost a lot of heat energy. But if you seal it, it um, it will keep that from happening, which we call a vapor barrier. Or if you use polyurethane foam, it does both. It will insulate and also seal. So these days, uh, polyurethane foam. Uh, is the ideal way to uh, seal up around windows and doors. This is um, using um, blown in insulation, this um, vermiculite, and don't see that too much anymore. It works very well, but I don't know how healthy it is for you. These days, you're using uh, um, other types of blown in type insulation like cellulose which is really just uh, ground up newspaper. They add a few other things to make a fire retardant but uh, it's very good insulation also. This is rock wall been blown in. Um, it's, it's very similar to the cellulose but cellulose is a little bit cheaper. This is another type where you can fill in the um, concrete blocks to help insulate. This is another process where um, we're using rigid foam board as the process to insulate. Now going to uh, the air conditioning equipment, we're sizing it up. And as we size up the components, we need to look at first how much CFM is going to be needed to um, 
to go through the house. As a rule of thumb, oh, it's not really a rule of thumb, air conditioning for every ton of cooling, every ton of refrigeration, which is 12,000 BTUs, it is required to have 400 CFMs for every ton. So that gives us ideal based on the amount of BTUs to cool the house and how much CFMs are going to be required. But here's another way you can look at it. Uh, we look at the, the, uh, the cubic feet of air times the square root of the pressure difference divided by the pressure one. So as you go through this, and it's spelled out here, and we look at the pressure one is the pressure drop given at the table for the CFMs one. Uh, CF1 is the flow rate given in the uh, coil resistance table. So we have to go to the coil itself, the manufacturer, whoever the manufacturer, it could be Ream, Carrier, uh, Bryant, um, whatever manufacturer that we are using the equipment. We go through their information charts and get that information. They all will have it. And then we look at the pressure uh, difference, the pressure drop across the coil. And from that information, we can determine um, the required amount of CFMs. And this here is a, it's a carrier uh, chart. And this chart has given us the information that uh, for that evaporator coil. And it gives you the sizes and the amount of CFMs that it's going to require for that to go through. And it gives you a static pressure. Here, looking again, the static pressure drop across a coil in a horizontal uh, type of applications. This is a different brand. It's a Goodman.